Inside a locked metal container, a woman named Kayla Brown can hear the sounds of a chainsaw. How are you, honey? This we're is bolt cutters. This is our best. Cutters. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. The young woman has been imprisoned by Todd Kolheb. She has witnessed Kolheb shoot her boyfriend. It just parents' worst nightmare. Todd Kolheb a popular realtor in South Carolina, a serial killer. a sprawling property in rural South Carolina. Police are searching for missing couple Kayla Brown and Charlie Carver. Shortly after their disappearance, uh, missing flyer posters go up, family starts reaching out to media. There's news stories um, in the public, public light about their disappearance. You know, weeks turned into more weeks, into months, and it just, parents' worst nightmare. You know, we went from maybe had an accident, you know, was in a ditch somewhere, to what happened. It was, it was a very, it was a long 65 days. Cops are about to make a breakthrough in the case. It's not good news. Yes, sir, I will. So, can I, okay. I'm not resisting. Okay, just stand up for me. Successful local realtor, Todd Kolhep. All right, this is where we're at, Mr. Kolhep. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay. Kolhep really became successful through his business. Um, he had a decent house. He had obviously bought in that 100 acre property in Woodruff. He had uh, several BMWs, motorcycles. What no one knew was that Todd Kolhep obtained his real estate license under false pretenses. Uh, Kolhep himself was a mystery to those that knew him. Uh, Todd Kolhep, uh, extensive history, a uh, very unique life. Um, he was born in uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida, before moving to Spartanburg with his mom. He was uprooted several times. His mom was uh, married and remarried several times. His birth father divorced his mom at a very young age. And, uh, and then when she remarried, his stepfather adopted him legally. Kohlhepp was born in 1971. By 1973, he's, um, he's described as being out of control. Right? This is two years old, though. So you, you think about the terrible twos, and you wonder, is it just sort of normal behavior? It soon emerged that there was nothing normal about Kohlhepp's activities as a young child. As a young boy, um, there's records indicating that he bleached a goldfish because he wanted a gerbil, meaning like he actually poured Clorox into a uh, onto a goldfish to uh, to torture and kill the goldfish. Um, he he shot pellet guns at dogs. He punched holes in his walls. He shredded his clothing. Not a lot of ability to connect emotionally with other other people. One of the biggest red flags for an eventual antisocial personality disorder, or what people colloquially know as psychopaths, is that they torture animals at a young age. And it shows a level of lack of empathy, lack of emotionality, and just something that can't simply be learned from your social environment, typically. It shows that there might be a genetic 
predisposition here towards doing evil acts. The adults in little Todd's life tried to get to the bottom of his troubling behavior. Nine years old, he's referred to um, a behavioral institute in Georgia because of his uh, mother's inability to enforce limits, because of his behavioral problems in school. But he wasn't improving. At 12 years old, Todd was moved to Tempe, Arizona, to live with a man he had not seen for over 10 years. In disagreement with his mother and her uh, marital situation, he uh, protested her and moved to Arizona um, to live with his birth father. To get his mother to allow him to leave her, he threatened her. He threatened to kill himself. He took a hammer to his newly remodeled bathroom. She gave in. He had been clearly manipulating and deceiving people from the time he was a child. And this really, he got quite good at it by the time he was a teenager. He might have seen his dad uh, as his savior from his mother who was unable to control him or who was absent um, or just disinterested in his life. But according to documents later used in court, Todd soon began to feel that he was playing second fiddle to his father's romantic relationships. In November 1986, Culhep chose a target to take out his anger on. 15 years old, Cole Hepp lures a 14-year-old uh, neighborhood girl uh, back to his house. Apparently, this 14-year-old girl uh, had rejected him. She had a crush on someone else. The records indicate that he uh, duct taped her, held her at gunpoint, um, sexually assaulted her, uh, and then actually proceeded to walk her home. He threatens her family. He threatens to kill them, and she believes him. She truly believes Todd is going to kill her family, and he threatens her, but that courageous girl spoke up. Todd's traumatized victim told her family what he had done. Less than 90 minutes after the abduction, Todd Kolhep was arrested at home. Kidnapping is a very serious offense. Uh, in Arizona, he might not have known what the, what the full punishment for his actions were, and he might, have, he might have known. He ends up going to prison in Arizona um, for about 15 years. At sentencing, a probation officer told the court that Culhep's lack of conscience could lead to more crimes in the future. Culhep blamed his behavior on his father for always being out of town. For criminologist Brian Frederick, the theme of rejection looms large in Todd Culhep's life story. Kohlhepp internalized this. Here's another woman that has rejected him that doesn't truly love him, right? That maybe loves someone else. That could have been the thing, the catalyst that caused him to snap. It was a theme throughout Todd Kohlhepp's life with devastating consequences for those who dared reject him. We shot the camera twice. Downward angle. You shot the hand twice at a downward angle, maybe twice. Twice, maybe third time, I don't remember the count. From one side, you don't want to waste rounds. The other side, you definitely need a desired effect. Todd Kolhep, always ready, willing, and able to kill. Locked up for 15 years in an adult jail, teenager Todd Kolhep played the model prisoner with few citations for violence or disruptive behavior. While inside and on his release, he worked towards a job. He is smart enough that he's gone to college. He's obtained knowledge. He has recreated himself. He has completely changed who he was, at least on the outside. So when he gets out of prison there, uh, moves back to Spartanburg, sort of starts his life over. Kolhep arrives in South Carolina, he gets a job as a graphic designer, and uh, it further tries to reinvent himself. But in 2003, Kolhep demonstrated he still had a mind for violence. He went to what was then a motorcycle store to buy a bike 
for $9,000. It all happened at Superbike Motorsports, which was a pretty popular motorcycle dealer and shop uh, there in Chesney, South Carolina, off of uh, Paris Bridge Road. So you bought a GSXR 750 from Super. It was 13 miles north of Kohlhepp's home in Spartanburg. I bought a motorcycle from them. I had gone back to them and told them that I was having a hard time riding it. And I was not so sure I had made a wise decision. Because I was inexperienced. They proceeded to give me well, on the rude side about uh, my inability to, to, to ride a, that kind of bike. Days later, the bike was stolen, and Kolhep suspected the guys at the bike store. And he claims they, to some degree, kind of made fun of him or just poked fun at his experience level, uh, which apparently really upset him. So you let it slide for the time being. Time being. Got mad about it, <clears throat> kept going out there. He's humiliated. He's made to feel small. This takes him back to 15 years old, the rejection by the neighbor. Simmering with resentment, Kolhep made a decision to kill. Bought a Bird 92 FS. So you had a 10, a 10 round magazine? Yes, sir. Three of them. Three 10 round magazines? Mm -hmm. It was November 6, 2003. Kolhep had just begun studying for a business degree at Greenville Technical College. I left college, left my class. Okay. Drove to Bowen Springs. Yes. Okay. Put the shoulder holster on at the CVS parking lot. So you put the shoulder holster on at both CVS and Wall Springs and then drove to the bike place, bike shop. Uh, sat on a few bikes, did my usual basic stuff for time and doing my best to make sure that the pain customers were not there. Collateral damage is not cool. So on a few bikes stalling for time yes. to make sure customers were not there. Soon, those left in the store were the staff. So it was Scott Ponder, who was the owner, Brian Lucas, who was the shop manager, uh, Beverly Guy, who was Scott's mother and also the bookkeeper there, and then Chris Sherbert, who was a mechanic there. I was not going for the mom, but she was there at the time. She was working there, but she got thrown into it. She wasn't a, <clears throat> she wasn't a primary target. Kolhep would later describe the cold, methodical way he had hunted his prey. You proceeded to go to the back mechanics area? Mechanics area, where the mechanic was prepping the bike. OK. Walked up, put out the Beretta, put the safety off. Now he's in this store. He's being humiliated again. His therapist, his caseworker, his probation work, his parole, they're not there to help him. His dad's not there to help him. Inside the store, owner Scott Ponder, service manager Brian Lucas, mechanic Chris Sherbert, and bookkeeper Beverly Guy. Shot the mechanic twice. Downward angle. Chris Sherbert died instantly. Once I realized that he was no longer a threat, I immediately proceeded towards the front of the building. At that time, all three. Okay. Manager, owner, and the mom. They had heard the gunshots in the back and were coming this way to figure out what had happened. Cole Hepp turned towards the mother of Scott Ponder, Beverly Guy. Mom was the closest, and mom was the closest. And I shot her two, three times in the chest. Um, not my best work. She fell. The owner and the manager 
ran for the door. Took off. At that range, they should have ran to me, not away. They were way too close. In the process of that, I emptied, popped a few rounds, and got one of them in the back. And he crumpled in the door. I put, I believe, two, maybe three rounds in him. I'm not sure the count. Did a reload while this guy was still running. This guy, but I, when I hit him, he crumpled in the door. Okay. When I did my reload, before this guy got out, mm -hmm. I put two in him before he, before, and he actually fell outside. Cole Hepp had achieved what he'd set out to do. Years later, he would look back on that day with not a regret of remorse, but pride. I will tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. Okay. Um, so it's like that one sounds like a video game. It's not a game, but it's almost like you. You're focused on, you've been there, sir. I cleared that going in under 30 seconds. You guys would have been proud. I'm sorry, but you guys would have been proud. The definition of a serial killer is somebody who kills two or three people over a period of time with a cooling off period. What Kolnhepp's done is Kolnhepp has kidnapped someone 15 years ago, and now he's committing mass murder. Okay, very different from serial killing. Minutes later, the massacre was discovered. A frequent customer, uh, a regular there who had known the, known the crew, he shows up and finds Brian and Scott's body in the front parking lot and, uh, and then finds the other two inside. So calls number one. Uh, the authorities show up right away, and next thing you know, it becomes a massive crime scene, uh, bigger than Spartanburg County has ever known. This is a mass murder, okay? This is a massacre of four people in a shop, minding their own business, but pushing the wrong buttons. The little boy who had bleached goldfish till they died, the teenager who had felt humiliated by a girl before assaulting her, who had felt disrespected in a motorbike store, felt disrespected again, so he killed the four people. There was uh, very, very little physical evidence left, left behind at the scene, which made it difficult to investigate. Next thing you know, years go by without it being solved. Todd Kolhep, two years after his release from prison, remained a free man, free to continue his studies, free to live a double life in a small city in upstate South Carolina, a place where he would soon become a respected realtor and one day hire the son of Chuck Carver. You know, I just remember that day when he came into this world that, man, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Charlie Carver disappeared one day, a day he had been with Todd Kolhep. Oh, Lord, that was an awful day, um, awful chain of events. In June 2006, 35-year-old Todd Kolhep wrote a heartfelt letter to the South Carolina Real Estate Commission. He earnestly requested to be allowed to take the state real estate exam and explained what he described as the grave misunderstanding that had led to his 15-year incarceration. The letter, littered with fantasy and untruths, made no mention of the duct tape, the sexual attack on a 14-year-old, or the threats to kill his victim's family. Three weeks after sending that letter, Todd Kolhep was a licensed realtor, something he turned out to be good at. He just devoted his life, at least on the surface, to his work as a real estate agent. 
He, he eventually uh, opened his own company, TKA Real Estate. He was the uh, lead broker, and he had uh, almost a dozen agents working under him, selling houses for him and everything. In 2007, he bought his own home in Moore, a town southwest of Spartanburg. He appeared successful, but he wasn't likable. A lot of his friends, coworkers, neighbors, they all sort of had a similar story about who Kolhev was, the type of person he was, his character. Many of them said how arrogant he was, just how uh, really full of life, full of himself type of guy. He would talk frequently about the amount of guns he had, brag about that, definitely a braggart. Here's how successful I am, here's my business, here's my, my hobbies. Um, I think because of that loud personality, uh, a lot of the, the folks that he encountered um, had, a, had a sort of eeriness feeling to it um, about him. And, uh, and so I think a lot of folks were left kind of wondering, you know, who, who's really the face behind, behind this guy that we're seeing? Seven years later, the residents of Woodruff, a nearby town, would ask the same thing. Eventually, he had bought a um, almost a hundred acre property down in Woodruff. Beautiful area, pastures, uh, rolling hills, trees. Immediately, Kolhep surrounded the huge patch of land with an eighty thousand dollar high chain link fence. Visitors were not welcome. Neighbors there would say, uh, "Hey, Todd, yeah, welcome to the neighborhood. I remember hunting in your property there. You know, we used to go down there and." and uh, hunt on your land there before you bought it. And his response was, your hunting days are over. They would hear uh, gunshots every night, um, hundreds of rounds of ammunition, they would say. So they were only left wondering, you know, what's, what's going on down there? Is there? There must be a lot of target practice, if that's, if that's the case. Neighbors had no doubt that Kolhep was unusual. But was he dangerous? Now that he's reinvented himself, now it's time to capture his bride again. Now it's time to, to, uh, to capture the woman that uh, won't reject him. Right? And he's going to ensure she doesn't. Charlie and Kayla, like they met through Kayla's mom, uh, became friends and just kind of stayed friends, you know, for a year or so. Charlie's father, Chuck Carver, remembers that in August 2016, the relationship was still brand new. They were basically just friends and then eventually I guess it led to them dating. I really didn't meet Kayla until the Saturday, I think it was, August the 26th or 27th. You know, they've probably only been dating just a couple of months. They hadn't been together for too long, but they started living together in Anderson. Kayla introduced her new boyfriend to her part-time employer, Todd Colehead. She meets Todd Colehead through a mutual friend, and eventually Kayla starts working for Todd through his business. He had asked her to clean some properties, so she had been doing that. She would go to houses to clean based on his request. On August 31st, 2016, Kolhep had a job for Kayla that required a little more muscle. Kolhep asked Kayla and her boyfriend, Charlie, to come to the property in Woodruff to help clean. This was primarily uh, to help him clean up uh, the land there outside. He wanted them to uh, make some paths for him and clean up some pathways for him. Wednesday the 31st, he didn't show up for work, or he was he was signed up to work overtime. And we found out a few days down the road that he didn't show up that day. Now, um, Charlie's mom texted him 
and he didn't respond on the 31st. Then Thursday, she didn't hear from him. Then on that Saturday, which was Labor Day weekend, she tried to get in touch with him. And she couldn't get in touch with him. She went by his apartment. Nobody was home. Texted him, called him for days. And then on that Sunday, his mom went ahead and filed a police report and reported him missing. It got pretty unnerving. Shortly after their disappearance, uh, missing flyer posters go up, family starts reaching out to media. There's news stories um, in the public, public light about their disappearance. The whole time for at least the first 30 days on our days off, time, spare time, you know, we would just cover roads, rural roads, looking for a car that was wrecked off the side of the road, park on the road, go down an embankment, you know, do anything that looked out of place. Uh, our car could be hit up under, you know, if it went underneath brush or whatever. Weeks after they disappeared, the couple started posting messages on social media. Charlie's family knew this was more sinister than a freak accident. An update, um, you know, saying that they were fine, that they were going to get married. Now, this is interpreted by family and friends as very unusual. They hadn't heard from them in, in quite a long time. And now there's this post that they've gotten married. That was the unnerving parts that then I was just like, it's not him. And I knew in my heart that it wasn't him. But it still bothers you. Um, he was an expiring writer. And, you know, he was writing books and stuff. And the what really tipped us off that it wasn't him was the grammar and words being misspelled. At this point, Anderson had been tracking uh, Facebook messages, tr trying to track credit card information, and they were waiting on um, cell phone pings to come back from the cell phone companies. Weeks turned into more weeks, into months, and it just, parents' worst nightmare. You know, we went from maybe had an accident, you know, in a ditch somewhere to what happened. And it was, it was a very, it was a long 65 days. Finally a lead. Kayla Brown's cell phone had pinged off several masts in the area immediately northwest of the town of Woodruff, an area dominated by a 95-acre compound surrounded by a chain link fence. They traced the property back to the owner, who was Colhep at the time. So that leads us to uh, November 3rd, 2016. On this day, there's a team of law enforcement officers who go to the property in Woodruff. Meanwhile, another team goes to Colhep's house in Moore, South Carolina, about 20 minutes away from each other. Forcing their way through the outer gates on Wooford Road, Woodruff, a team of officers began to search. First, they combed through the large, partially renovated barn building. It was empty. Then they noticed the shipping container. And this shipping container had several padlocks, chains, really bolted shut this place. After two months, signs of life were perhaps not what detectives expected to find. Unsure of who or what they were going to find, searchers began to prize the container open. They spent a long time cutting through all this metal to actually get into the container. Watch out, y'all move. Just the girl, just the girl. How are you, honey? This we're is bolt cutters. This is our best friend. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? This ain't loose, Plumber.
As one team of officers broke into a metal shed on Todd Culhep's rural property, another held the real estate agent at his home and more. All right, this is where we're at, Ms. Culhep. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay. What's your name? What's your name? Right here. Lauren. Lauren. Okay. All right. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. How are you, honey? This we're is bolt this, cutters. This is our best. Cutters. He's a paramedic. Oh yeah. Okay. We're gonna get you out of there. Okay. Just hang loose, Lauren. Anybody got? A, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't. I got it right here. Hold up. Y'all slide back. Hold on. He's, He's got, got a light. We gotta let him get pictures. Randy, let me see your light, Randy. You can you can put your hand down, sweetheart. You're okay. We're here. Okay. We'll get the rest of it here. Okay. Hold on. 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 Hold so the sheriff described it as uh, walking in there and seeing her chained up like a dog. Both feet. Just one. Let me see. Okay, to attached? a chain to okay. the wall okay. and my neck's attached to the wall up here. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to get you out okay? You got a handcuff here. Bolt cutter. Just hit, hit the chain right there. Loose. Hold it up. Yes. Just, no, just right there at her hand, Brandon. We'll, we'll get it off. We'll get it off here. Cut it right here. Kayla has a thick dog chain wrapped around her neck. Metal cuffs were cut from Kayla's ankles, too. The man who owned the container was confronted with the discovery. We have Kayla. We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container, OK? OK, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? She's on your property right now, locked in a container. They just got her out of a, like a, um, they called it a shipping box. Connex, box. Connex box. She was locked in a container in a Connex box. They got her. We, are, we have investigators, we have like 20 investigators on your property right now. And they have found her in the Connex box. So she never left your property. Kayla told officers she'd been kept captive in the storage container for 65 days. He had made her his sex slave. Reports that uh, he had raped her repeatedly, sometimes twice a day. Where was Kayla's boyfriend, Charlie Carver? His anxious family recall hearing news of a breakthrough in the case. November the 3rd started off like a normal day. You know, I got up, uh, got the family up, we had breakfast. Everybody went to school, work, you know, the normal routine. Then about probably 12 o'clock that day, 11.45, I got a phone call. And it was from uh, Anderson City Police Department. And the gentleman on the line told me, he said, uh, Mr. Carver, we need to talk. Uh, we found Kayla. And I just remember thinking, wow. You know, I mean, because at that point, my first question to him was, where's my son? And His response was, we haven't found him yet. Seemed like an eternity to get to Woodruff. We followed the patrol car out there, and they warned us ahead of time that the media presence was just overwhelming. They said, don't talk or stop, just drive by. One of those camped at the gates to Cole Hep's rural plot was journalist Daniel Gross. Being the crime reporter, I rushed to the scene. Um, was one of the first journalists on the scene there and just started reporting um, what was going on down there. Police everywhere. Neighbors had come out, seen what was going on, helicopter above. Of course, then we learned that it was uh, the massive property where a missing woman out of Anderson was found. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie? Yes. He shot him? He shot Who him. did? Who's... Todd Colehep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the 
tractor locked me down here. I've never seen him again. He says he's dead and buried. If you want to help yourself, tell me where Charlie's at so we can go find his body. That's, that's pretty much where we're at right now. Do you want to help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? You don't want to. No, sir. Why'd you shoot him? I didn't shoot him. That's right. She's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's mm -hmm. body on that property. No, so you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the connect box or anything? No, I'm looking for Charlie. Uh, probably a good thing. What happened to Charlie? Detectives now knew Cole Hupp had abducted Kayla Brown and held her captive. So at this time, I'm gonna need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already handcuffed. He's already killed. Okay. You're under arrest right now for kidnapping. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I will. Okay. I'm not resisting. Okay, you stand up for me. Will you? Stand up for me. Yes, sir. Putin. Cops in Woodruff warned Charlie Carver's family that news of the missing man might be delayed. I said, if all y'all want to go back to Anderson, just drop me at the gate, because that's where I'm staying. And they, they were all in the same position I was. No, we're not going. So we just pulled into the gate right there where all the everybody was going in and out of the property. And that's where we stayed for the next four days. Meanwhile, authorities uh, canvass the property. They go through what they said was every acre of this property. Just a day or two goes by, and they find Charlie's body. On that Friday, they thought they found him. They weren't sure. They eventually brought Cole help back to the property. They said to help make sure they were in the right areas. Then on, I guess it was Saturday evening, late, the coroner and them finally came out and told us that it was Charlie. And they were sorry to tell us that he was deceased. It just didn't seem real. The, com the whole conversation, you're thinking, no, it can't be. You know, you, you get to that point, you're denying it, you know. You got to show me, you got to prove to me that you know without a doubt that it's him. You know, and they were going off of um, a couple of tattoos that he had and things of that nature. That's how they identified him. It's a hard thing to accept that your son is gone. Once they arrive, they show up to the property together, same vehicle, and uh, go up to the garage that was there. And immediately, Colehead comes out, uh, fires three shots, three gunshots into Charlie's chest. Um, he dies on the scene. Charlie was murdered that very first day. You see, Todd didn't need Charlie. He wanted Kayla. He made Kayla her chained up sex slave. He says, um, you know, when you've killed someone that they love, it's much easier to control them. As investigators interviewed Kayla Brown, she told them she and Charlie were not Cole Hepp's first victims. The mystery of Megan and Johnny Coxey, who disappeared on Christmas Day in 2015, was now solved. In late 2015, Cole Hepp lures Johnny and Megan Coxey, a couple in their late 20s married, to his property with the promise of a bogus job offer. The Coxies, they they lived a pretty modest life. They had a small home in Spartanburg County. They had uh, three kids in total uh, combined together. And they had a criminal record. Um, so they had a, a pattern of uh, petty crimes. 
The moment the couple arrived at the property in Woodruff, Kolhap turned on them. He kills the husband immediately uh, and then keeps Megan alive for some time. And he holds her there for about a week's time. Uh, this is near Christmas of 2015 and until Megan tries to get out and uh, she, she puts up a struggle with, with Todd and Todd kills her. Confronted with this story in custody, Todd Kolhep finally started talking. Well, the girl that was with Johnny, did you shoot her? Not at that time. Okay, what happened with her? She panicked and then she sat, I told, told her to sit down, she sat down. Mm -hmm. uh, went ahead and cuffed her, mm -hmm. patted her down, mm -hmm. tied her up, left her there. While I tried to figure out what to, I, I didn't know what they were in there. Right. Um, got rid of Johnny, came back, left her there, went and got food, fed the girl. I held her there for a couple days. How many days? Five or six. But if I walked her outside, I walked her outside, I put a four in the back of her head. This has a similar MO. Let's look on the property. And sure enough, they discover the bodies. They find the body of uh, Johnny and Megan Coxie, um, all there in shallow graves. Todd Kolhep was not done with his confessions. Just a couple of days after he was arrested, he sat down with investigators and confessed to being the only one responsible for uh, that quadruple homicide in Spartanburg. And the investigators knew right away it was him based on the level of detail he gave. They said only, only the killer would know these things. And they were all, all shot, uh, several gunshot wounds, but all of them had a gunshot wound to the head. So now he's looking at seven bodies to his name. In fact, Kolhep told his captive, Kayla Brown, that there were many more victims. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here. He told her at one point that he was nearing the triple digits. Uh, he said he, he traveled, traveled the country, he traveled outside of the country. This is posturing. This is, look what I did, you know. Um, and what have I got to lose now? I'm sure he thought 15 years in prison is nothing compared to what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go down big. He writes from prison to say that there are more bodies. Is he fearful that he's going to be forgotten? Is he fearful that he's not going to be in the papers any longer? Only about six months after his arrest, he enters a, a plea deal. And the families all agree that in exchange for the death penalty, uh, which would be a long, arduous process in South Carolina, uh, lengthy appeals process, um, issues with lethal injection drugs not being available, um, they, in, in, in light of that, they opt to go for a life sentence in prison um, without the possibility of parole. You know, my wife and I, we, we struggled for about two months trying to make the right decision. You know, I'm, I'm not a young man anymore, and I might not see the last appeal. Charlie would have gave you the shirt off his back. You know, I mean, he would have gave you his last few dollars, whatever he had, if you needed it. And for him to take him out the way he did was terrible. And, you know, and, and, I, and I said that, you know, and I did look at him because I wanted him to know. You know, I realized he didn't have significant role models in his life, from mother to father, stepdads or whatever. Uh, he was passed around, but there's right and wrong, and everybody knows what's right, and everybody knows what's wrong. You choose to do what you do. And, you know, I would prefer Todd just to go away and we never hear from him again, you know. Maybe that'll happen one day, I don't know.